Okay, Rabbi Ellie Fisher. It is Elo. There's a nice breeze wafting through the uh, the sada, the field. Hamelach basada. Feel the presence of Hashem. Thank you for gracing us with your presence, coming back again to visit us in the yeshiva, your home. It's always good to stop by yeshiva during Elo, just to smell Elo, to smell the Kol Torah, to feel the religious energy. It's so hard to build that religious energy. So thank you for coming and picking up our religious energy and contributing to our our Abbas Hashem and Yer Hashem during these high moments of our year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for um, inviting me here. So, like everything else in life, role models are crucial. Mm. Rebbe Lichtenstein always told us, don't ask in theory what, how to solve a moral crisis, but identify role models and put yourself in their place or ask them how they would respond. Plenty of role models for tshuva. The tshuva is very private. And it's hard to share. You don't want to share. It may sound, if you share with people, as if you're being arrogant, or virtue signaling, how great you are, you're Balchuva. So all, it's hard to climb. I think we had the rubber talk about this when he would give a share once heard in his name, the Salvechuva. Like he, he teach you a sugya, it's hard for me to recreate the emotional landscapes of tshuva, the emotional process. When you think of tshuva, who do you go to? Who, whose imagination do you try to insert yourself into? Whose lenses do you try to view this world through? Yeah. So as I said, it's it's hard to find role models because when we think of Bali Chuva, we're thinking about people that did you know a, a major lifestyle change and we're not necessarily looking for that. So it's very hard for it's it's hard for us to find for, for us to find role models. Um, when I think of if if I was gonna pick a role model for Chuva though, um, it may sound you know, hopefully I won't, uh, you know, hopefully there aren't people waiting here to stone me. Um, I think my role model for Chuva in a lot of ways is Franz Rosenzweig. Okay. Um, Call out the stoners. <laughs> yeah. Why Franz Rosenzweig? So Franz Rosenzweig was born to a German Jewish family, late 1800s, was not to an observant family. I don't know who they affiliated with, but they were what we would call Amaratsu. He did not get much of a Jewish education. And what he did was German language translations, probably mainly of you know, the Bible, maybe some commentaries, uh, not the meat and potatoes, what we would call, not Gemara and, and, you know, and the Postkin. Not the Shas and Postkin. During World War I, you know, slightly before, slightly after World War I, he had a little bit of an awakening, a religious awakening, and in which he decided not to convert to Christianity, which is okay, it's something. Surah But that, it's the Surah And he wrote a book of Jewish philosophy during World War I, but even in that book of Jewish philosophy, The Star of Redemption, it's not very learned Jewishly. And it was critiqued as such by other members. He, he lived in Frankfurt by certain members of the Frankfurt community, like Rabbi Breuer. Um, but then, he embarked on a process of real learning. And there's this one, there's this one metaphor that he uses when he's, uh, you know, when he's asked why he didn't take up a university position. He said, I started, basically, I started cleaning out the basement and I took things down from the basement up into the light of day and I found that what I had down there was actually treasures. So I just kept on bringing things up from the basement. And there's one, it's, there's one, another line that he has that has a very contemporary feel, which is after he wrote an essay called The Builders, um, he described it as, and this is an English translation, he described it as a hygiene of return, meaning a way to do tshuva, which is how he describes it. And he said, rather than have people somersault into the law, which I think he means, by that I think he means flip out. Mm -hmm. Right? I think that he may have been, he may have coined the term flip out. He says that you want to take, you, you want to take your whole biological, your, your whole biographical self along with you in the process. You don't want to change your past. You want to be learning. And as you learn, you can, you know, more and more things become possible for you. Your past becomes organically. Yes. Yes. You're taking your past, like you're, 
your past is not an accident. You accept right. that your past is not an accident, right? This is not pashup shot, but you know the pasuk of you know kichui machem devarim shuhu el Hashem, right? Transitory, not divorce. What? Transitioning, not divorcing your past. You're right. Uh, the devarim there is probably you know pashup shot is that it means words. I think that it also means like you take all your baggage well, with you. Kichui machem with you. Take yourself. Take, Right, uh, imachem, devarim, like all, and like all your stuff, all your right. baggage, right? Veshuvu al Hashem, and, and right. that it's that entire right. self that's going into the process. But that means that it's going to be a slower journey. Right. Well, this may be the only conversation in history in which Franz Rosenzweig is going to be associated with someone I was thinking about. But you know what? You never know where, where the, the, the wheel turns. The real creativity. So, who's your role model? Look, so much of the tshuva, in, in a previous conversation, you mentioned Rebbe Lezer ben Dordaya, famous Gemara of Zara, someone who was a dissolute, promiscuous, uh, sexually addicted person. But there was this moment that I call a rupture. The prostitute that he was with mentioned his, his fate to him, and that just his whole world came crashing down. To me, the ultimate rupture is Yona. <laughs> you can't get more rupture than being swallowed by a whale. These moments in life that our narratives are shattered and we see ourselves for whom we are and then there's this 180 turnaround and there's energy and honesty and courage because you're facing death, because you're facing realities you wanted to deny. I think of the brothers in Egypt where they had scripted this false narrative. I'm sure they believed they were correct. I'm sure they believed Yosef was the villain. I'm sure they believed God was on their side until they realize it wasn't. And then when they're lying in those jail cells or they're waiting in, in, in the room for interrogation, so there, there are chuvas, and I have had moments where my, I felt like a rupture or a, a confrontation with myself and thinking about death or thinking about my own, and those are very powerful chuva. You mentioned Franz Rosenzweig, I, I mean, I don't want to bring someone even less, even less safe, sacred, but I remember reading um, Oscar Wilde's picture of Dorian Gray, mm. where this very, very immoral person paints an image of himself, and all of his guilt and monstrous activities are projected onto it. And then, like, you pull the canvas up, and you, you see yourself what you've become. And I don't think he took it in the direction we'd like to take it of virtual recovery. But, is, but those moments of rupture are few and far between. Like you said, how do you find someone who doesn't face a ruptured, fractured moment and is still able to transition? I think it would be Akiva. I think it would be Akiva's tshuva because there is no, again, he's standing at the well and he sees the water and he sees the rock, but it's a moment of calm. And the, I think of the water, the calm sound of the water. It's a moment of serenity, just like our waterfall. There's no fracture. There's no, there's no great reveal. There's no broken narrative. He's thinking. And then, as you said, he embarks on a long journey, but he makes a complete transition in who he is. He goes from being one man to being another man. And those two aspects of his recovery always intrigue me. How do you not just perform clinical or, or microscopic chuva on particular aspects of character, how do you reach for something completely different that isn't caused by a rupture? I know how to be different if you face death. People have near-death experiences, they become someone different. If I'd be swallowed by a well, I imagine I'd be, it would transform me. Literally. Yeah. But how do you transform in the broader structural sense without facing those ruptured moments? Yeah. I wish I knew. Yeah. So there's in another Pasuk that's, that gets a lot of play these times, the Shuva Yisrael Ad Hashem Elokecha. So there's a Medrash Tehillim, which is echoed by the Ibn Ezra, um, that, you know, Chika Shaltab Avonecha. So it has this image of you're trying, you're on a path, and you're trying to go on this path, and there's this giant boulder that's blocking your path. And the, the Medrash says, Satateyu kima kima, right? Just hammer away at it, chisel away at it, little bit at a time, right? And Ibn Ezra says, La'at la'at ad Hashem alokecha, right? That if you, when we think about tshuva as a lifetime process, as a lifetime goal, you know, I think it becomes much less daunting. I'm not trying to be a different person after Yom Kippur. I think it's ironic that we end Yom Kippur with Hashem Hu HaElokim, right? Which is, you know, that's what Klal Yisrael shouted at Har Karmel. They had this, this, this moment of revelation, this moment that they experienced one of the greatest miracles. And Izevel says to Rabbi Akiva, like, okay, you won today. Let's see where they are tomorrow. Tell you. 
you have all set. What did I say? Yeah, everybody Cuba. Oh. <laughs> uh, you have all set to Elio. Elio and Navi. Like, we'll see where they are tomorrow. This kind of stuff wears off. The, right. You know, the wow, Eliyahu. the wow effect. Yeah, and I think that that's what Eliyahu's lesson was, right? That it's in the cold of Mamadaka, and it's not. It's not in the. I think that's reinforcing that next episode in the story of Rabbi Akiva is reinforcing what he should have learned from that episode, right? It's not in the rah-rah. It's not in the storm. It's not in the the momentary... Uh, Flash. Yeah, it's in the cold of mama. It's... So let's move to the other end of the spectrum because we're f- failed and flawed as people. And Shuv has a journey towards authenticity. And good luck with that because we, we all meet our barriers and we all have a hard time scraping away conceit and, and denial. Um, so at some points, we also think about people who are not role models for tshuva, but are lifeguards for tshuva, whose tshuva was flawed and imperfect, but we say, well, if they can perform tshuva, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu accepted their tshuva, so maybe my flawed, imperfect brand and grade of tshuva shouldn't be enough, because that's really the seesaw of Yom Kippur. You're striving for the heavens, but you never get there, and you have to be able to just appreciate whatever victories you did achieve on Yom Kippur, even if they're not the grand designs that you set out for yourself. Because if you, if you don't have that middle space, you'll be very, very depressed after Yom Kippur. You're not, you're not going to reach all of your goals and ambitions. Who do you think about? Who's tshuva that's imperfect, that was coerced, that was in, uh, in, uh, uh, cowardly, but Hashem still accepted it? And you say, well, that speaks to me. I'll tell you mine, because it's a different type of a question, but I think it's a real it question. Is. I think about Kayan, hmm. who, who barely could take responsibility, who was insolent, but said it's my sin. Ownership, not responsibility, authorship, let's say. I think about Daniel, who, who was the first person to say, L'cha Hashem, Matzdaq, Avalana, Barsh, Zepan, and we can imagine how, how much denial the people were in, because they thought they were immune, they thought they were impervious, they thought they were invincible, and finally accepting Hashem, Hashem's judgment and treatment of you. Think about Achan a lot. You know, Achan was, was forced into it, basically. It was a very, very shallow and flat confession. But, okay, may, hopefully ours aren't intimidated confessions, but they certainly are psychologically incomplete confessions. I think about the the vicious cycle of Vidor Pat, that when I confess for false confessionals, <laughs> am, I, am I just basically falsely confessing for false confessionals? Because <laughs> I don't even mean to be, to, I don't even feel remorse for my false confessions while I'm trying to feel remorse for my false confessions. So I feel like I'm trying to reach for these little straws to hold on to. Well, okay, but it may not be the, the tshuva of Yona or the tshuva of Mikiva, but Hashem accepted Daniel and Hashem accepted Achan, at least, uh, not for, uh, to exempt the punishment. So is there any part of that that you feel maybe personalities or even in your own tshuva? Okay, this may be imperfect, but that's all I got. Yeah, I put it this way. I do have such paradigms, um, but it's people that I've encountered. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plead the fifth. You're here to name names. <laughs> that's what I called you here. Top 10 people you've met who've confessed all their dark secrets to you? Yeah. <laughs> we're, so we're not going to go there. I don't want to. Now is not the time to start, you know, looking down my nose at other people's tshuva. Um, especially since we're not talking about biblical figures. Which I'm, I'm thinking about real life paradigms. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep that one to myself. Okay. Okay, you'll have at least more zuchuyosa for you to give her time. Hope so. Okay, so maybe since we're, this is the second in the three-part series, maybe the third part is we'll talk about frustrating moments of tshuva, when we feel frustrated, when we hit those barriers to tshuva, and we're looking for end-arounds and solutions, and we'll see where that takes us. Not about people, but about the barriers of tshuva. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so thank you. And uh, let's, let's hope that those role models uh, join us in our imagination as we look for inspiration. And thank you for coming. Thank you.